The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. We're going through this end time series. This is part four. So people are visiting with us. I don't know what to do. So we'll just get into the sermon. <laughs> just, so what we'll do is, I, I started off by saying that in order to understand the end times, you don't just read the book of Revelation. The whole scripture is God breathed. And everything in the scripture, right from Genesis to Revelation, has intricate details about his coming, believe it or not. And as we study the word in detail and you see those types and shadows, it's a word that is used in the book of Hebrews, where you see the images of what God does in history. Some things that are there, some uh, events, some people, some places, they're type and, sim uh, and symbol of something that's going to happen in the future. And everything in the scripture points to Jesus Christ alone. Let's remember that fact. Everything in the scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, points to Jesus Christ. So and one of the things, one of the things we are looking at in order to understand the end times are the feasts of Israel. I did a whole series on this feast a few years ago, but I'm looking at it this time with the perspective of end times. God gave something called these feasts. God gave the feasts to the people of Israel, to the Jewish people, and said, these feasts are mine. You celebrate them. You commemorate them. And he uses the word rehearsal and appointed times that I covered last time. You know, these are not the feasts that man made up and man came up with. There's a difference when man comes up with things and difference when God comes up with things. And God gave these specific instructions and as to how to celebrate these feasts and they're very essential for us to understand. There are seven feasts in total. The Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And the first four feasts happened during the first coming of Jesus Christ. And the last three feasts are symbolic of the end times and that's what we are going through. During Passover, on the day of Passover is when Christ was crucified, and the day of unleavened bread is when he was put in the tomb, and the feast of first fruits is when he came back from the grave. He resurrected on the feast of first fruits, and on the feast of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came upon uh, the Jewish people, and that's how the church, the Gentile church, was birthed at that moment where the Jews, and then it passed on to the Gentiles, and that's when uh, the word church comes into place. On the Feast of Pentecost, everything in this feast happened with such precision that these three feasts that are coming in the fall are yet to be fulfilled. We need to know what God is up to. And in order to understand these end times about the second coming of Jesus Christ, we need to understand that if God could do four things out of the seven on time, there is a possibility for us to know the times and seasons, as we saw in 1 Thessalonians 5 last week. You know, the coming of the Lord is a good and a huge controversial topic among Christians because there are few views. I'm not trying to be intellectual this morning. I'll just share uh, three quick things that people believe in. One is called the pre-tribulational view, pre-tribulational rapture. If you ask me what that meant, Probably eight years ago or ten years ago, I have no idea. I went to a Bible school when people were asking questions about what do you think about pre tribulational rapture? I'm like, what is he talking about, this fellow? You know, I had a hard time understanding this, but I think I got it now. It's a pre tribulational view, is people believe that rapture, the word is not there in our English Bibles, in, in, um, in uh, Greek, it's harpatio, we're snatching up, is there and uh, they believe, pre-tribulationalists believe that the church will be taken up before the tribulation begins. The tribulation is a seven-year period of intense trials and sufferings. And then the second coming of the Lord happens, and then the millennium, a thousand-year reign of Christ, and then eternity begins. Eternity, I didn't put a line there because eternity is not time. Eternity is different from time. 
When we say eternity, we usually put two, uh, a long line with infinity on one side and infinity on the other. That's bad physics. Eternity is outside time dom- domain. God is not bound by time. Time is a created thing. We'll get into that as we go in this series further, okay? We'll just understand what time is in the, as we go further. So that's pre-tribulational rapture. The next thing is there is a mid-tribulational rapture. People believe that rapture is going to happen in the middle of tribulation, which is half of seven years. It's three and a half years. That's when tribulation happened. And uh, the third kind of people are the post-tribulational rapture believing people where rapture happens and you come right back down and you rule and reign from Jerusalem. So three different views now, all put together, you see how where the rapture's positioning is different. So this morning, don't shoot me down because I'm going to use pre-tribulational rapture in order to explain this, okay? If you don't believe this, that's okay. As long as you believe that Christ is coming back, I'm happy, and we are happy, okay? Let's not fight about it. It's very important, church. Remember this. Let's not fight about it. As long as you believe that Jesus Christ is coming back, Amen to that. When is he going to come? It's up to you. What I made up my mind after my study, I'd have made up my mind. So let's not fight about it, okay? Let's be good people. So I have to tell this again and again because the amount of contention that happens just to figure out when Christ is coming back, ministries have started up tearing about each other. That's not Christian-like. No, that's not Christ-like, period. As long as you believe Christ is coming back, I'm happy. But based on my study... And based on what Seaside believes, um, and based on the feast, based on Daniel, based on the other minor prophets with the major message and book of Revelation, for me, things fell into place where pre-tribulational rapture, where the church is taken up before the tribulation begins, that's the picture um, I see constantly throughout the scriptures. And this morning, we'll do one more thing again in order to establish that fact. So pre-tribulational rapture, we covered the uh, pre-tribulation rapture. We, we covered the Feast of Trumpets first, which talks about how the church is taken up. That's last week. And today we're going to see the Feast of Atonement or the Day of Atonement. That's what it's actually called. It's a tribulation, a symbolic of the tribulation and the judgment that's going to happen in the future. You still okay with me this morning? We, hey, post-tribulational, mid, we're okay. Okay? Okay, praise the Lord. Okay. Day of Atonement signifies tribulation and judgment of God. Where did this word tribulation actually come from? The word tribulation comes from the uh, Greek word tribulum, and this is the word that is very important for us to understand. There's one harvest that happens in the, uh, in the Jewish cycles of harvest. There's, there's barley, there's wheat, there's grapes, and uh, while they're harvesting wheat, there's something strange that happens. If you look at the grain of wheat, it's pretty hard-shelled. And in order to get the grain out of the husk, they use a plank with stones embedded in the sockets, as you see. And a person stands upon this plank, and this plank goes on this grain on the threshing floor in circles. And as this plank is crushing this grain on the outer shell, the seed comes out, leaving the husk behind. And this plank believe it or not, is called tribulum. And this is where the word tribulation comes from. Okay, now, moving on. Tribulation is a time, as you can see in this picture, it's a time of intense testing, a time where the world is going to be judged for the people who are left behind, who didn't receive Christ as their Savior, people who were not ready for the Feast of Trumpets. You remember that from last week. The Gentiles who were not ready, for, that, for them it's a time of intense testing. For the Jewish people it's a time of intense testing. And it's a seven-year period where a severe hardship is going to come upon people. These are the future events that are about to happen, my friends, by the way. We are not that far from it. So this is symbolic. See how hard this tribulum goes on the grain, that's how God is going to test his people. So day of atonement, how is this symbolic of the period of tribulation? Leviticus chapter 23, 27 to 28, 31 to 32. On exactly the 10th day of this month, this is what God told the Israelites, of this seventh month is the day of atonement. For it is the day, it is a day of atonement to make atonement on our behalf before the Lord your God. He shall do no work at all. It will be a perpetual uh, statute throughout all generations. 
in all your dwelling places. It is the Sabbath, complete rest to you, and you shall humble your souls. The key word, humble your souls, is related to the Day of Atonement. And on the ninth of the month, in the evening, from evening until evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. This is a time of intense testing. It's a time where the Jewish people, during the time of uh, day, during the Feast of the Atonement, they humbled themselves. Why? We'll see in a little bit. It all began with the time of Moses. Moses went up to Mount Sinai, and by the time he came back with the Ten Commandments, the Israelites were worshiping the golden calf, saying, this is the one, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt, and they were uh, doing some pagan ritual there, and Moses was upset, and he breaks those Ten Commandments. And as he was upset, you know, he calls upon, calls upon the people and says, who is on the Lord's side? The Levites come take the sword and 3,000 people were killed that day. Then Moses goes up again on Mount Sinai. He goes up on the first of Elul. It was the month before Tishri. The Tishri we saw last week, that's the month where the Feast of Trumpets begin. So he, he, Moses goes up on the first of uh, Elul. During that time, the Israelites mourn for the sin that they committed. And from sunset to sunset, they grieve and they fast for 40 days. And the next time Moses returns was the 10th of Tishri. And by the time he comes back, he comes with the replacement set of those 10 commandments. And upon his second coming, he sees these people who are repentant, a nation that is repentant. And then he announces it to them that they are forgiven. And he also makes a decree that this is this 10th of Tishri would be a day of atonement for all the generations to come. So this day of atonement is also known as Yom Kippur. What does atonement mean, first of all? So it goes from the first day of the trumpets to 10 days later, the 10th of Tishri is a day of atonement. Atonement means covering. Becomes one, at one meant. You become one with God. What is this covering? What is, what's, what's going on during this day of atonement? It was a time where the high priests, the Levites, the Israelites, they all come before God for the forgiveness of the sins. And that's the day the judgment was pronounced upon the nation of Israel, whether they're actually forgiven or they will be judged severely for their actions. And I talked about the three trumpets last time. The first trumpet is blown on the Feast of Pentecost. The last trumpet is blown on Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. And the last great trump is blown on the day of atonement, symbolic of the end of the judgment. So the two aspects that are important for us to understand this feast, the two things that happen, the atonement for sin and the judgment for sin. Everybody say atonement for sin and judgment for sin. I don't want to lose you this morning, okay? There's things here, details we need to go through. The two things that are very essential that will happen what is this atonement for sin? What, what, what does that mean? You see, friends, when Adam and Eve sinned, the separation between God and man happened. When sin entered mankind, we were separated basically from the fellowship and intimacy with God our Father. And in order to restore this, God always wanted to dwell among his people. God loves each one of us. He loves fellowshipping with us. But sin separated us from God. And in order to restore this relationship, blood sacrifices were required because Hebrews 8 and 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. There's no remission. So bloodshed was required. So God gave an agenda or a plan, detail to Moses. And he said, Moses, you know what? I want to come and dwell among your nation, among my people, among my Israelites. But this is what he got to do in order for me to dwell, build something called the tabernacle. And I'll show you a pattern, Exodus chapter 25, according to, to which you must build this. So God gave instructions to give, build a dwelling place for him to come from heaven, to live among his people. But in order for the people to approach God, they needed bloodshed, sacrifices, because by the shedding of the blood, there's a remission of the sins, but also they needed a mediator. And for this tabernacle, they needed somebody called the priest, the high priest. So what this priest did is he acted as a mediator between the people and God. 
That's what this priest's role was. But on this uh, day of atonement, this priest's role was something different. His duties were beyond normal. There's something absolutely different. First of all, he separated himself in one of those chambers of the temple. You know, first it was tabernacle, then it was a temple, Solomon's temple, and then uh, Zerubbabel, I think he built another one. Herod modified it, the second temple. So this temple was a place, a meeting place between God and man. On the Day of Atonement is a day which is very sacred, <clears throat> where the high priest entered the Holy of Holies, a place where the Ark of the Covenant is and where God's glory dwelt. He only entered this once a year. And it was a very scary time for a priest, the high priest, to enter this beyond that curtain. And on this day, the high priest made his way into the Holy of Holies with the blood in his hands, the blood of the sacrificial animals, and sprinkled it upon the mercy seat of God. Why did they need this? Why did they need to take blood? Why, did the, why was the priest so scared to enter into the Holy of Holies? Very simple. God is holy. We are not. And a holy God and a sinful man will not mix. Why? His very nature itself will consume us. That's why. His very nature of holiness cannot, uh, we cannot survive in the nature of his holiness. We will die. We will perish. And the only way to approach God is through the sacrificial blood. And Jesus Christ is the one who shed his blood and became our mediator, our great high priest. That's what the Bible says. And because of what Christ has done, we have access into the presence of God. But let's go back again to the Old Testament. I'm running ahead of myself here. Here is a priest who once a year, on this day of atonement, with the blood in his hands the, uh, of the sacrificial animals, he enters into the Holy of Holies. And usually he wears garments which are known as the garments of beauty and glory. They're eight-piece garments that you see on the left. Extremely beautiful, intricate and when a high priest walked in the streets, people knew he was somebody special. He's the mediator between us and God. So people had great reverence for him. But on the Day of Atonement, he stripped down to linen garments, linen turban, linen robes, linen sash. Because he was sim it, was symb it was symbolic of humility and brokenness. Before God, none of our glory stands. Before God, no matter all our accomplishments and achievements, our status in the society doesn't matter. We're down to the core, down to the bottom. We bite the dust, and here is a high priest. In all his humility, he walks in into the Holy of Holies and pours his blood, sprinkles his blood upon the mercy seat. There are three sacrifices that were made that day. A bull for the priest for a sacrifice, and there were two goats that were, that were sacrificed on this day. What happens with these goats? Let's understand a little bit about these goats. There were two goats. Exactly identical, paid with the same price. They, had to, they buy it from the temple money. They're very identical in nature. And one, was, one of them, they cast lots. And one lot was called La Adonai. It's for the Lord. Another one is called La Azazel. Means a scapegoat. One of these goats is sacrificed and his blood is taken into the Holy of Holies. The other goat... This is what happens with the La Azazel, the scapegoat. The priest laid his hands upon the goat and transferred the sins of the whole nation upon this one goat. And the high priest would lead, uh, the, one of the priests would lead it out, outside the city and then throw it off the cliff. It's called the sacred cliff. And then it would crash to the ground and it would die. It was symbolic of the scripture which says, as far as the east is from the west, the Lord has removed the iniquity of his people. That's what it's symbolic of. So the priest took and put the sins and the whole this uh, goat from the mountain got killed. And there's no way it could come back. The forgiveness of sins has happened. It's symbolic of something that happens in the book of Revelation. Parallel you see in Revelation chapter 12 verse 9. A great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the world astray. If we look at Revelation chapter 12, this exact scenario where Satan himself is hurled down during the time of tribulation, the seven-year period. If you read that chapter, you'll see the full picture. It's symbolic of that. 
And when this goat was hurled down, a small snippet here, which is so wonderful, before the scapegoat is taken away, they cut a scarlet ribbon and tied it to his horns. And one part of the ribbon is with the goat. The other half, they tied it to the door of a temple, of the temple. And when this goat was thrown, hurled down the cliff, and it died, strangely enough, the scarlet ribbon that was tied to the doorpost used to turn white in color. The scarlet turning right. Though your sins are scarlet, they'll be turned as white as snow. That used to be every year's ritual on the Day of Atonement. Then the people knew that they were forgiven. What a beautiful picture. And if you read the Jewish books, the Talmud or some other commentaries, the scarlet ribbon stopped changing color around 30 AD. Why? Because the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world was slain and there is no longer a need for sacrifice anymore. Strangely enough, Jewish books record that event. No longer a sacrifice was needed. So here is a beautiful picture of what the judgment of God for the sins, how it's hurled down. There's something that I want to uh, present to you is about the Ark of the Covenant. This is the only day that the priest enters this ark, uh, this chamber of Holy of Holies, I said, the, goes beyond the veil. And here in this tabernacle, if you see the layout, the extreme uh, east is where the Ark of the Covenant is. And this is the ark, the chest where the Ten Commandments and the ro budding rod of Aaron and the part of manna were kept inside the box. And the top part is called the mercy seat and upon which the blood was sprinkled. And the only mention, believe it or not, in the book of Revelation of the Ark of the Covenant is made in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. This is what it says. Then God's temple, let's pause for a moment. God's temple, in heaven there is God's temple. Because Moses built this tabernacle, the layout that God gave was a pattern of what he was seeing in heaven. It's an exact replica. The temple is a replica of where God dwells. So in God's temple, there is an Ark of the Covenant, and this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. Then God's temple in heaven was open. Within the temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant. There came flashes of lightning, rumblings, uh, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. The only time the Ark of the Covenant is seen in heaven was a time of the beginning of the judgments. The only time the Ark was seen in Israel's history was during the Day of Atonement, and you see the parallels between those two. Another imagery of the judgment of the nations. One of the most interesting things that happened is seven days before the Day of Atonement, the high priest separate himself, separates himself and enters into a chamber called the high priest's chamber. For seven days he's not seen. He's getting through the rituals. He's getting through mentally. He's, he's, uh, he's practicing how he would approach and what he would do in the Holy of Holies. It's a whole sequence of things, but the seven days are symbolic of the seven years of tribulation where we, along with the bridegroom, are hidden for a little bit during the time of judgments. That's what it's symbolic of. So as I said before, the first part, the atonement, is the atonement for sin. The day of atonement. The second part is the judgment of sin. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid the price. The atonement for, for sin was done. But the second part, the judgment of sin, is yet to happen and it's coming. The second part is yet to be fulfilled. How can we understand this imagery? Daniel records it in Daniel chapter 7. And this is what he sees in his vision. Daniel was repentant and he was praying for the sins of his nations. He says, Lord, we have sinned. He was grieving and mourning over the sin of the Israelites in captivity. And when he was mourning for it, God gives him a vision and a revelation of who he is. And this is what he says. As I looked, the thrones were set in his place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Ancient of Days took his seat. That's a very important statement because a high priest never sits in the tabernacle. The whole nation on the day of atonement remain standing because they don't know when, what the Lord will pronounce as a judgment. But when Christ finished his work, the Bible says he sat down at the right hand of the Father. That means the work is finished. The ancient of days, talking about Christ, 
is seated, my friends. That deserves an amen. Amen? He finished the work. He shed his blood and is seated. His clothes were white as snow. His, the hair on his head was white like wool. His throne was like flaming fire, and his wheels were all ablaze. I don't know how to paint this one. You see a lot of paintings about God in the future, the resurrected Christ, or the heavenly Christ. Those paintings don't make sense because our finite minds are lower than the higher being of God himself. We cannot portray the complexity of what heaven would be. And this is what Daniel describes him. But I don't even know what he's trying to say. We can't even comprehend because John was trying to describe heaven in the book of Revelation. He says, I see uh, uh, transparent gold. What is transparent gold? And he sees water like a crystal. What is he looking at? How can you describe? How can he fathom with the limited vocabulary that he had? What he's seeing in heaven. And Daniel is beholding Christ in all his glory. But he says his hair is like wool. Because if you paint a picture this way, it looks pretty bad. But if you look at it in all his glory, it's something beyond comprehension. We need to get into that. One day we'll see him for who he is. But right now, let's bear with Daniel for his description. And the river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands, listen to this, thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Day of atonement is a symbolic uh, picture of how the heavenly court is in session and how the righteous one, our glorious Savior Christ, is going to judge the nations. According to the Jewish tradition, there are three kinds of people um, that are written in this book. The names in the book, the rabbinical tradition says, there are three kinds of people that our God is going to judge. Number one, righteous people. They're going to be forgiven. Their names are written in the book of life. The unrighteous people, their names will be blotted out or their names will not be found in the book of life. And the third kind is the people who still are yet to make a decision to choose whether to be righteous or to be unrighteous. These three people are going to be judged every day, every time on the day of atonement in Jewish history. What are the implications? The righteous are declared righteous the unrighteous are condemned, and the people who are living between those two, neither righteous or unrighteous, they have to choose either life or death because that was the last chance and opportunity. How is this symbolic of the tribulation period? During tribulation time, the three kinds of three different kinds of people that would exist where God is going to judge them. Number one, the righteous people are the 144,000 Jews that God is going to preserve. Uh, let me explain a little bit. When Jesus died and he rose again, till that time, God's promises for the, for the Jewish people. Bible says salvation is of the Jews. So Christ came for his own. Remember the Syrophoenician woman was asking for healing from the, for a demon-possessed daughter? Christ says, I cannot take the bread from my table and, and, from, uh, and throw it to the dogs. And the woman says, even the dogs are eligible for the crumbs. So Christ came for the Jewish people. Christ the first phase of history was all about Jewish people, if you look at the Old Testament. But when Christ died and he rose again, and Jewish people rejected Christ, it's because of God's marvelous divine predestined plan, salvation came to the Gentiles, and we are living right now in the times of the Gentiles. 2,000 years have passed, and we are living in God's beautiful period of grace given to the Gentiles. But the time of Gentiles is going to come to an end, during rapture with the church, the Gentile bride is going to, take it, to be taken up, and then the clock again begins for the Jewish people, and they're going to be brought back into the saving knowledge of the Messiah whom they pierced and killed. So the 144,000 are the righteous Jewish people because God is, um, during the seven-year tribulation period, is focusing back on his own to bring them back into the revelation of who he is as the Messiah. And the unrighteous are the evil and the wicked one. They're going to be judged very severely and third kind is neither or. These are the people, it's basically the Gentiles who missed being ready for the preparation of the bridegroom when he came. These are the people who will be given a second chance, but many will become martyrs, if not all of them. But also, this tribulation period, is, this is what happens. There's one important aspect that this tribulation period is symbolic for. It's symbolic for the judgment of blood. Right now, if you look at the world, 
It's absolutely shocking to see some of the atrocities. And you think, and I think, God is not doing anything about it. And this time of tribulation, the Bible says, will be a testing time and a trying time for the shedding of the blood of the innocents. Yesterday I was watching the news. There's a lady who was pushing her kid, 13-month-old kid, in a stroller. A guy came with a gun. This is in Texas, my friends. Came with a gun. He says, give me your money. She said, I didn't have any money. She, she didn't have any money. He shot her. The one grazed her ear. He shot her in a foot. Next, he turned his gun and shot the 13-month-old baby in the head. My point is, what are we coming to? From January this year to March, around the world, 9.4 million babies are killed and aborted. From January to March, I was looking at the abortion clock yesterday. You see the clock ticking. Those are the babies that are dying. The time of the shedding of the innocent blood continues unabated, and we think God is silent. In 70 AD, when the destruction of Jerusalem happened, many innocent prophets and people were killed. Many righteous people were killed. This is what God said in Matthew chapter 23, 34 to um, 37, 39. Therefore, I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of, some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue them from town to town. So upon you will come... All the righteous blood that has been shed on the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel, that's in Genesis, to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I tell you, all this will come upon this gener uh, generation. Christ continues to say, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent you, how often I long to gather you as children together, as a hen, hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left, you, left to you desolate, for I'm telling you, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba Bisham Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Don't take God's silence for granted because God is going to judge the nations. In the Old Testament, one of the final kings, his name was Manasseh, and 2 Kings 24, 4 says, he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. And next thing that you know, notice in history, is Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes Israel into captivity. God judges his people for shedding innocent blood. Dr. Billy Graham said, I think if God forgives America for the sin that we commit, for the immorality, for the injustice, or all these things, he has to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't ever think that God is silent. The coming tribulation is for also, it's also for judgment of the shedding of innocent blood. Revelation chapter 6, verse 10 says, They called out, these are the martyrs, they called out in a loud voice and said, How long, sovereign God, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge their blood? If God is a God of justice, He'll do whatever it takes to wipe out these people who are wicked in His sight who have done injustice and betrayed his plan for mankind. There's a future judgment that is coming for people who took him lightly. Then we talk about the golden altar. There's some other scenario that fits in with the Day of Atonement. There's an altar called the altar of incense that you see in the holy place. It, usually a priest comes and he burns incense upon this altar. But on this Day of Atonement, the high priest himself he goes and pours this incense upon these hot coals, and a whole pile of smoke just erupts from that incense. And this is something that is spoken of again in the book of Revelation, which happens on the Day of Atonement, which is very symbolic for it. And this is what the Bible says in Revelation 8, 1 to 5. When you open the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. I saw the seven angels who stand before God and the seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. 
He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke from the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censers filled it uh, with fire from the altar and hurled, hurled it onto the earth. There came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. The golden altar is symbolic of the, about, of the prayers of his people. When people are crying out for justice all over the world and they're crying out to a living God, remember, these play, prayers are collected and one day God is going to use them to judge the mankind. The shedding of the innocent blood, the, martyr of, uh, uh, the martyrdom of the righteous, the vengeance of God is going to be shown. Another interesting thing, there was a 30-minute silence in heaven in this chapter that is recorded. On the Day of Atonement, when the priest enters into this holy place and the Holy of Holies, the whole nation stands still in this absolute silence. Nobody's rejoicing. Nobody knows what God is going to declare that day for the judgment of the nation of Israel. They don't know whether their sins are forgiven, whether the judgment of God is going to fall. That's a day, that's a deciding day. A complete picture again of what's going to happen during those days. You think God is a judge, a righteous judge? Let me share with you a couple of incidents that happened in my, that I've seen in my own life that I'll share with you, which really shook me and made me believe that our God is absolutely perfect and absolutely true and is a God of justice. There's a small town. I'm, I'm talking about the experiences close to where I was brought up in India. There's a small town close to my uh, place where I come from called Amlapuram. It's a small town. There's a lady who used to go from house to house, preaching the gospel, sharing the good news in this small village. The Hindu radical militants that didn't like what she was doing, and one day they beat her so bad, they stripped her naked and made her walk through the streets of that village. And then at the, uh, when she came to the end of the village, they threw her out of the village, and she fell on the ground and she cried out to God and said, Lord, is this your fate of your servant? She cried out that. Within a few days, a hurricane, it's called a cyclone there, it hit that place. It's November 1996. Trains were lifted off the tracks. The sea sand was in the fields where people were planting the crops. The strength at which it came and hit that place was absolutely devastating. More than a thousand people died, number of homes lost, and people knew they dealt with the child of the Most High God. People knew that they messed with this woman who was a child of God. I'll give you another example. Last week, before I was concluding the sermon, <coughs> I was talking about Graham Staines and his family. This man of God is a missionary in my neighboring province called Orissa. This is where we support some of the missionaries from. Graham Staines with his two sons, one day he was on a mission trip. He worked with the lepers for close to 30 years in India. And one day while I was sleeping in, a, in, the, in the truck, he and his two sons were burned alive by the radical Hindu militants. This is the picture of the burnt truck. And the wife and the daughter are the only ones that survived during that tragedy. This was in 1999. And within a few months of this incident, a Category 5 cyclone came to the exact region where this man and his two sons were killed. 15,000 people died. Ships and the boats were seen on the seventh stories of buildings. 19, 90 million trees just snapped 1.6 million people became homeless. 275,000 homes were utterly destroyed. And I and my friends went to the same location after the hurricane. A few months later, we went. We landed very early in the morning in that town because somebody else was supposed to come and pick us up. We went to a corner store where they were selling tea. We were drinking a little bit of tea. And it was dawn, it's a little dark still, and behind the tea stall, we saw a huge tree that's completely uprooted and it was still lying there. 
We asked the guy, what was it like when the cyclone hit? He said, you don't want to go through that. Then the next question we asked, why did it happen, you think? You know what he said? He's miles away from where the missionary was killed, but you know what he said? They killed a killed good man, and their God judged us. He's not even a Christian. That's what he said. I'm not telling you a word of a lie. He said, they killed that good man, and their God judged us. We in North America are so comfortable talking about the God of the past. We say, God did that for the Israelites, great. We read the scripture and say, oh yeah, great things have happened. But we don't, we forget to recognize that he's alive today and he's coming back soon. Unless we get into the mode where we believe that he's still a righteous judge and have that reverence and that terrifying fear within us, my friends, we are failing the walk, the Christian walk. Don't take God lightly in your relationship with him. He's a holy and a God of justice. Remember, this is a beautiful psalm that my wife showed me last night. Psalm 50, verse 21, this is what God is saying. These things you have done and I have kept silent. You thought I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. God is saying, these things you have done, we are doing some things because, you, uh, and I kept silent that God is like, yeah, okay, whatever I'm doing I'm, is fine. He's not doing anything. And we, you thought I was altogether like you. When we don't have that reverence for God, when we don't know who he is, we make him like one of us. We make him a buddy. We make him a partner. Hey, dude, that's not your dude. That's the most high God. Give him respect. He's a most high God. We thought and we made him just like us. It's dangerous because he says, I will rebuke you and set them in order before your very eyes. We are dealing with a holy and a jealous and a passionate God. So my friends, beloved Christians, as I complete this sermon, I say, show mercy to one another because it's a judge who is going to judge us. Love one another. Do justice. Don't rip off people. Be righteous Christians. And also, the third thing, walk humbly with your maker. Humbleness is not stooping down to the least possible height. Humbleness is not this. Humbleness is standing before God who shows how small you are. Every time you think this pastor's head is getting big, all I have to do is go and pray and stand before God who shows me how worthless I am, how useless I am, how foolish I am, and yet, in spite of me, he uses me. This terrifying experience. We are fighting the wrong battles, North America. We are fighting the wrong battles, seaside. Just watch your life. Know who you're dealing with. Know the mighty and the righteous judge. He will do God. He is a God of justice. He will do what is right. The 9.4 million babies just this year are crying out. That blood is crying out. He will do justice. Injustice in Africa, in India, raping of these women, uh, poor, needy, broken people when they're being abused. You think God is looking at it and just letting it go? Don't you ever live under, the, under that illusion because God is going to rise from his throne and he's going to set the twigs ablaze very soon. Let's walk in this reverential fear of our most high God because time is coming to an end. The day of atonement, the day where one is humble in God's sight. We need to stop messing around as Christians. Stop using the Christian jargon. Stop getting familiar with Christianese and stop living, start living a life that is humble, that's reverential, and don't fake your Christian life anymore. Tonight is the night. Today is the day. You say, when you walk out of this place, Lord, I don't want to be the same. I don't want to be a person who is not passionate, not true in my walk with you. Everybody thinks I'm right, but who am I according to your testimony? That's what matters. Because one day we give an account, the Bible says, to every idle word we speak. Don't harm others. Be righteous. Defend the helpless and the needy. This is what Christ told us. Because one day you'll be brought into account for everything we have done, and everything we haven't done.
Feast of Trumpets, Church Taken Out, Day of Atonement, symbolic about of the tribulation times that are going to come. Then comes the Feast of Tabernacles. Just to give you a little heads up so that you can be happy, it's called the Festival of Rejoicing. So that Sunday will be okay. Okay? So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. There's too much injustice in this world, Lord. I don't know what kind of world we're living in. Help us to bridge the gap between you and this world. My Lord, separate us from everything and everyone else. You call us peculiar people. Help us to be peculiar. You called us a royal priesthood and a holy nation. We say, as one of our friends was reminding this morning, we say we believe in an extraordinary God, but we live such an ordinary life. Forgive us for that. May your zeal consume us. And may we know whom we are dealing with. Our Father, our King, Avinu Malkenu. We bow down in humility. Help us to show mercy, to do justice, and to walk humbly with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.